Welcome to this week's episode of the Founder and the Force Multiplier podcast, where we explore how founders and leaders work together with their right-hand partners to turn ideas into action and build wildly successful businesses. Today, I'm speaking with Christine Valenzuela. Christine has over 25 years of experience as an executive assistant and chief of staff in several industries, including software, aerospace, and manufacturing. She is currently an executive assistant to an engineering executive at Atlasian. Her career started off as a receptionist many years ago, and she worked her way up to operating as a chief of staff for C-level leaders and a multi-billion dollar aerospace company. She strongly believes in advocating for other chiefs of staff and EAs to make sure they understand their value in the workplace. Christine's passion, energy, and commitment around the executive assistant and chief of staff career and their career development is contagious. Listen in as we talk about the incredible impact EAs make at their organizations and how they just might be your next executive level hire. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I think you will, then be sure to let us know in all the usual places, such as leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this episode. Hey, Christine, thank you so much for joining me today for the podcast. I'm excited to have you here. I know. I'm excited to finally talk to you for this. <laughs> I know. I know. And I mean, we, we only met a couple of officially a couple of weeks ago, but right. after that conversation we had, I was like, we got we to gotta make this happen. We got to keep going. <laughs> yes. So let's just kick it off with this first question for you. What okay. is the one book or podcast that you would recommend or that you do recommend to people over and over again? This is like asking me my favorite child. And my children ask me this all the time. I can't do it with books because... Okay. I don't know. I just, I just, I'm kind of a newer reader. I, 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 I haven't been that much into reading until the past couple of years it's since it was really the pandemic that started it. And then I started reading a lot more. And so I haven't gotten to the point where I'm recommending books, but podcasts, there's so many that I listen to. The one that I think is most interesting to me. And I tell people, if you want to learn about really nerdy brain functions, but understand it in a very simple way, I tell people to listen to the Huberman lab. Uh, uh, yep. I was just talking. I, I listen to that all the time too. <laughs> just talking to somebody like 30 minutes ago and they were like Huberman lab listening to every single episode right now. I've listened to every single one. And some of the things are really complex, but he explains it in a really easy to understand fashion. And it's stuff that you, I've never heard from any doctor or anyone else. So it's, I love yeah. it. I love it. Yeah, I do too. The the one of the episodes that always pops into my head is the one that he did not too long ago, I think, about alcohol yep. and some of the new alcohol studies that have come out. And it was just like they don't I don't hear this information very often. So that one sticks with me. Yeah. I like wine and I think about him every time I drink wine and I know. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. That's you can't one. drink enough red wine for it to actually be good for you. <laughs> right. That's what I read and heard. <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself and why you consider yourself a force multiplier. As far as being a force multiplier, since I started in this field and really without any kind of prompting, I've always approached any job I've had with, how can I make this job easier? Whether that's for my boss, for my customers, I've always thought of it in those terms of, I, I guess I, I'm oriented to, to help people. So I've always, that's always stuck with me. And it turns out it's really good when you become a force multiplier, because that's really how you have to approach your job. And I've kind of expanded on that sentiment ever since. I'm a career EA admin outside of a couple stints, one as an event manager for about seven years. And then I was later a project manager for a couple of years, but I, I kind of got into this profession right out of high school. I didn't go to college college. And I, at least I didn't go to college right away. I do have a degree now, but I thought, what can I do? I'm, I'm, I have no degree. I'm smart. I present well. I'll be a receptionist. And it's like, eh, I guess that'll... And then I kind of went from there. I never planned on staying in the field. And to be perfectly honest, I was a little bored with it in the beginning. Mm. It wasn't until I started working as an EA and started working with C-level executives that I got the challenge. And then I've been with it because you know that once you're in that environment, then you're hooked. I know. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it was, the, it was the case for you when you started working in that C, in this C-suite, the C-level, but to me, it's about when you really become that, that partner and you're yep. able, and you're starting to, to be involved in strategy and projects and, and really maximizing everything that they do. That's where it also got interesting for me. Was Absolutely. that the case for you? Yep. Absolutely. Yes. I, I started to view myself as a business person at that point yeah. and I loved it. And then that kind of led to me getting a business degree. 
<laughs> because yeah. I thought this is perfectly suited to what I do and I can always apply it no matter where I go from here. And so, yeah, no, I've been with that ever since. I love it. I, I really like that you mentioned that you started considering yourself a, a, a business person, right? And I don't think that that's often talked about, but <laughs> what did you, because I feel that way too. Like, I really feel like I'm a, a business partner. I am a businesswoman. Where, like, what was the shift for you when you really started to see yourself in that way? Wow. That's a good question. I think it had to do with when I started working for, I made actually the jump from going from an admin to an EA. And I applied for a position. I knew it was probably three levels outside of where I currently was, but I had good energy behind it. And I thought, if nothing else, I can at least say I met the head of my company and, and other executives along, along that interview process. And they know who I am. They can put a face to a name. I was like, and that's good enough for me. I was like, if I don't get hired, I already have a job doing what I'm doing and that's fine. And I, it really clicked when I interviewed with them, they saw me, they heard me and immediately within 24 hours, they're like, we want her, even mm -hmm. though HR was telling them, you're going to have to do like a three level promotion to get her in that position. And my boss was like, I don't care. I want her. And then I started interacting with executives at that point. And this was a multi billion dollar company. At, and so I, I felt like I could hold my own with them. And that's really when I started to wear that hat. Like if I can hold my own with these folks, I'm in a good place. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and I, I just think about the EA role, like we, we have to be able to hold our own when we were working with these executives all, and whether we, we were faking it a little bit or there's imposter syndrome, there's all sorts of feelings involved yeah. in all of it. But at the end of the day, I think that you, I, I love that you were able to acknowledge like you're in the room with them. You're half the time probably leading them, leaning up to them. And there's a lot of, that's really empowering. And, and I, and I wish that a lot more EAs felt that way right. because they're, they're, they are doing that. They are those business people. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the more that we have these types of conversations, they start to feel that empowerment as well. So speaking of kind of empowerment and career development, you and I met on the a Power Up a couple of weeks ago where your energy and your passion <laughs> around the executive assistant role and career development was just like insane. And so what gets you the most fired up about the executive assistant role? Well, right now, my focus has been on promoting our value outside our field. As there's tons of podcasts, books, speakers that provide support for EAs, chiefs of staff within the field. And that's amazing because every career needs that type of resource. But I've noticed that there are not enough people who are promoting who and what we are outside the admin field. And that is really how we're going to change our perception of our jobs is to affect how other people see us. And that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting to be on your podcast, because I know founders are part of your audience and they're the people who really need to see us. And I, 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 through no fault of their own, I feel like there just needs to be someone to provide that perspective of what we can really do, because most of what we do is, is behind the curtain and our bosses, we could sit next to them. They don't always see what we're doing because they're in business meetings and, and, and managing things. So I like to bring all of that to the forefront so they can start to, to, to really understand what we're capable of. So if you're a C-level executive and you're listening, you're watching it, keep listening because I hope I can provide some really valuable information to you about what I think is the most pivotal role within your executive organization. And that's the force multiplier. Yeah. So to all of those founders and leaders who are listening, what do you want them to know about the EA role? Well, so the first thing is that we're generally viewed as a support function. And because of that, it's it keeps us in a certain lane. And I think it either intentionally or unintentionally creates a limiting belief about our level of skill. And that's really what I want to focus on. Work is constantly given to us. And because we're overachievers, we say yes to all of it. And we appear to rise to the occasion every single time. And people will interpret that as, hey, this is somebody who's good at their job. I heard recently that that's called the zone of excellence, which I think is a great term. Yes, we're, we're in our zone of excellence. But that's far different than, and, and it should not be confused with being challenged. 
In fact, you could almost make the case that if you're rising to your zone of excellence all the time, every day, you're probably not challenged enough. Mm, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and just because, well, someone does well at something, it doesn't mean that that's all they can do. And that's kind of where I'm getting to that limiting belief. So I think founders and force multipliers look at it as, okay, this is your job. You do that. This is your job and you do that. When it really comes together a lot more than they, the founders probably think. And where work is concerned, I think executives don't often enough give us the big, tough, hairy projects that show what we can really do. And the, the one interesting dichotomy is that our bosses do the same things we do. They do their job well over and over again, but because no one has a limiting belief about what they're capable of, because they're a CEO, they're a founder, they're a C-level whatever, mm -hmm. they get those big, hairy, challenging projects over and over and they get that opportunity to show what they can do and rise through the rank. And so my big ask for executives is when was the last time you really challenged your force multiplier, whether it's a chief of staff or EA? And by challenged, I mean, give them a project that you would normally give to one of your executive direct reports. Are you giving your force multiplier that environment to make sure they can get to the next level and beyond. Because I think you'll find that they're really, I don't even want to say a diamond in a rough. We're, we're a diamond in plain sight. You're, we're, we just need to be utilized so that uh, that comes forward. How much of that do you think about providing these opportunities, these challenging opportunities to, e to EAs or to the chiefs of staff? How much of that do you think is the responsibility of the executive? And how much do you think that is the that is the responsibility of the force multiplier. I think it goes both ways. So the executive has to keep his or her eyes open to see this is somebody highly capable. Let me let me stretch that boundary and 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 get them outside their comfort zone a little bit. So they have to be willing to see that they've got a very capable person. Mm -hmm. And then by the same token, the force multiplier needs to come to them and say, what more can I do? And whether you're directly or indirectly saying, I need a bigger challenge, because otherwise we could get caught up in the day of, of just rearranging things on the calendar or responding to people or, or managing an offsite event or reaching out to people in different departments, which is great because that's all within our skill set. Mm -hmm. But you know that if you do that every day, all the time, we can do it because we do it well. It's not the challenge, there's not the, there's not as much of a challenge in it. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, I, no, I, I completely agree. I really, it is, I, I agree that it's like, it is a give and take. It can, it, we can't just rely on the executives to provide the opportunities, nor do, maybe should we just sit around waiting, waiting for an EA to raise their hand. It, it is a little bit more of that, that give and right. take and both wanting to continue to grow that partnership and, and grow the EA's skill set and career. Right. Right. I mean, it really is, I hate to use this analogy, but it, it really is like any other relationship. There, there's got to be something on both sides and it has to balance out. And sometimes it's 60, 40, sometimes it's 40, 60 or whatever that differential is, but you always have to sync together in some way. And you can't, you can't just rely on the other person to, to take care of things. You've got to, uh, you know, it's, there's give and take. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's just, that's just good leadership in general. And I mean, I'm such Absolutely. a big ad advocate of EAs really owning a lot of it on their own and, and taking control of their career and that and doing a lot of that that work on their own. But at, at the end of the day, I mean, they are still employed by a leader who, as a, the very definition of a leader, they have responsibility to their direct reports, just like my direct, I have responsibility to my direct reports to exactly. nurture them and to help them grow and to, and to help coach them. Right. I hope the people, the leaders listening to this, don't forget that they, they have that responsibility to their EAs and chiefs of staff as well. Exactly. What do you think makes a really great strategic partnership between an EA and chief of staff or an and or a CEO? Throughout my career, I, I sadly have only had a few really great bosses and I'm lucky to have one right now. So this is easy to answer because those intangibles really do stand out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, all these things kind of go both ways. But again, when you think of it in terms of a relationship, there's got to be integrity. There has to be trust. There's got to be mutual respect, good listening skills, common core values is an important one. You have to have enough comfort with each other to express candor because a lot of times founders need to hear the things that, that are tough and that candor you, we need to use. <laughs> Here's the way I like to think of it is 
a lot of the direct reports are usually trying to get where our bosses are. And so sometimes you, I've heard head bosses tell me this, sometimes they take what they say with a grain of salt because they're never quite sure what their direct, the angle of their direct report. Mm -hmm. Like, are they saying this to make themselves look good? Or what is the idea behind it? Your force multiplier has no skin in the game. Our only goal is to see you succeed, to see you do better, to do what we can to make your life easier. And so we have, we need to have that level of candor to tell you the hard things and know that it's coming from a place of respect and appreciation. And we're not trying to get somewhere. That's just us doing our job. Those are all really important things that you need to have to have that strong partnership. And if any of those things are missing or only one way, you can still do your job and do really well. But I feel you're always going to be limited in some capacity. Um, how did you go about developing the trust? I agree. Trust is so, so critical. But how did you go about actually developing that trust between you and your CEO? I think the times that that's been the most successful, it has really been in those moments of chaos, really. It's been when they haven't had time to overthink, could she do this? Can she trust? It's those times when literally the dumpster is on fire. Everyone is running their different ways. That's kind of my bliss zone. I, mm -hmm. I operate really well when that dumpster is on fire and all 10 dumpsters are on fire and the building's about to catch on fire too. So that's really when the trust is, has grown because the founder will walk out and be like, this has to get done. I don't know who's going to take care of it. We just, it just needs to happen. And so at that point, I usually just run with it. And it's, it's upon reflection after the dust is settled that they realize, hey, you really, you really stepped up. And I really appreciate that. And that's, it's those moments that, that really help to define that level of trust and, and wherewithal to handle stress under pressure. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it sounds like being willing to step up mm -hmm. and and take on whether it's responsibilities or take on a, a huge challenge and and, and showing because it's always easy it's always better to show than to tell right now really just showing what you're actually capable of but but really the first step is being willing to to step into that which right. can be hard and which can be very challenging and it can be and I think one thing that interferes with that from a force multiplier standpoint is people are scared and they interpret okay if I'm scared or if I feel nauseous or they feel like that's something's wrong because I feel this way. And I'm here to tell you, you just have to push through it. It does not mean, it just means you're on the verge of something new and new things are scary and you just have to go past it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember who said the quote, I'll have to look it up, but a fear, feel the fear and do it anyway. Exactly. Um, you're going to be scared. You're going to be nervous. We're, we all have these feelings. It's, it's, you don't, they don't need to not exist in order to be able to move forward. You have to just say, okay, I'm going to feel them, but I'm going to do it anyway. I was an athlete as a kid. So I learned that phrase, no pain, go, no gain. So I always think of that. Well, no pain, no gain. So <laughs> throw it at me. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about executives a little bit here. So in your opinion, are EAs and chiefs of staff executives too? So this is probably the edgiest thing I've ever said, but yes. I believe we should be considered executives. Our titles and our pay need a lot of improvement to get there, but yes. And if that's too much of a stretch, I would love for founders to stop and ask why they wouldn't consider promoting us to an executive level. If they don't want to change our pay, change the, the title, which is needed, but mm -hmm. why would you not consider promoting your force multiplier? And that's kind of opening up Pandora's box. So if you want me to break this down a little bit, you want me to go further? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well, first of all, just even starting with considering them executives in their current state as an EA or a chief of staff, like I, our EAs and chiefs of staff in our organization are part of the leadership team. And right. I do know in some organizations, they are considered kind of part of right. the leadership team, part of the executive offices or as an executive and, and some are not. So right. talk to me a little bit about that first, and then we'll talk about the promotion piece. We are already operating in that world. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's it's mainly that limiting belief because we're viewed as support. And so we, we're thought of as we only provide a support role, but we are right there side by side with our leaders. Wow. We, are, we are in the trenches. We are assessing risk. We understand strategy. We know your business. 
we know your business and, and your goals for your business and what you want to do. And we know your executive team, I would even argue better than you do, because I think one thing a lot of founders don't realize is your executives have moments of vulnerability, like all human beings do, and they aren't always comfortable coming to you or to other executives when they have those moments of vulnerability. So who do they go to? They go to the EA or the chief of staff. And it may come as a surprise to some founders or C-level executives that we have been providing unofficial mentoring to your executives. So we know how to help you solve your problems. We are also helping them solve their problems. And, and I do mean everything. We, we help them decide who they should hire. We help them figure out a succession plan. We help them to decide how to analyze risk. Um, we help them to understand the big picture and how this one small thing fits into the big picture. We help them. We li I've literally stepped executives through how to manage three hot projects at once because some of them just don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. We've been the ones to do that. We are already there. We are already operating. We don't have the title. We don't have the pay. But trust me when I say we are already there. Yeah, I honestly just like that chills as you're talking about all of that because <laughs> it is you so perfectly summed up what EAs and chiefs of staff, I mean, I, I know we can get into the whole title conversation, but really what that right-hand partner is doing for the, CE, the CEOs and founders that is not talked about enough. I can think of a million examples too, where I've had people come into my office and yeah, we might be talking about what, what projects to prioritize. Mm -hmm. We may also be talking about issues that are happening at home that might be affecting them at work. Exactly. So we do already operate as this this strategic advisor to our leadership Absolutely. members, as well as to our, our actual leader. So how do we go about kind of shifting this perspective and perception of this role even more? And then I think that goes a little bit along with what you were talking about, like, how do we start getting people to see that maybe your next VP should really have, be your former EA or the next right. C-suite executive? Maybe that's your chief of staff. Talk to me about that. So I, I, the way I think about it is, how would you approach hiring an executive? Usually you're looking for intangibles and you're looking for tangible qualities. So intangibles, what do you want in a good leader? Who has integrity, they're trustworthy, good communicator, they're influential, strategic, they can build relationships. We've got that. You want someone who is comfortable with ambiguity. I mean, I, I could probably do a TED talk on operating with ambiguity. This is, I would say the number one thing that I've, counseled other executives on is, well, they didn't give us the whole answer. What do we do with that? We don't have enough detail. And I'm like, this is what you do and break it down. Yeah. That, that is our whole world is operating with ambiguity. And so, so we do a lot of that. So that's, that, that, that's another intangible is the whole ambiguity situation. Usually you want people who are really smart. We are there. And I'm going to say this kind of thoughtfully. I don't think I need to say that, but I'm going to say this more as a reminder. And I, I'm, I'm not just talking about force multipliers. I'm talking about all employees. But there should never, ever be a correlation between a person's title and their level of intelligence or their capability to rise to the occasion. Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely have that intelligence. And the fact that we operate in your world all the time pretty much speaks to that. Uh, we can troubleshoot efficiently. That I think is an intangible. We, our only speed is quickly. And so we are probably some of the best employees at knowing how to size up a situation, assess it, come up with a not 100% solution because it's never about getting something 100%, but we can put our finger on the pulse and understand what to do, who it affects. And we can do that probably quicker than a lot of executives can. <laughs> Yeah. So, and then you've got the tangible qualities. The right force multiplier knows your business and what's going on with your business and what your goals are, who, you know, what your hot projects are, what your long-term projects are. What we don't know, we are experts at using our resources to fill in the blanks, which is you know, really, that's what executives do. Mm -hmm. uh, you use your resources. You go to your CFO to help understand what's going on in, with a, if you've got a bottom line issue you are having them speak to that. And we do the same exact thing, but we have the, the 
the business skill to to know how to operate. We we can develop and implement systems. We analyze and set budgets. We can manage multi million dollar projects. We can drive your strategy across your direct reports and and beyond that. We know how to think ahead and consider impacts to different areas of the business. And best of all, because we're usually on our own island, whatever we don't know, we will figure it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there's managing risk. How can a how can a force multiplier handle risk if they haven't had to do that before? Well, the one thing I'll say to that is as Cape as gatekeepers, we do this every day, all the time, because if we let the wrong person through or don't let the right person through, there are far reaching implications to that. You know, we already have to know who to let in, who to keep out, why we're making that decision and strategic and financial implications of all of that. And if that's not risk, I don't yeah. know what it is. The last thing I'll, I'll mention, because it's an important one, is, is usually when you're looking for an executive hire, you want to hire experience. So we've observed C-level leaders for years, which is essentially a masterclass in doing the job. What kind of, wouldn't the right, what you should ask yourself is wouldn't the right person pick up a thing or two along the way if they're watching a masterclass unfold in front of them? That's learned experience. The analogy I like to think of is when you get a driver's license. Up to that point, when you get that license, you've yeah, okay, you may have driven a little bit, but for the most part, you haven't done it actively all the time every day. But mm -hmm. how is it that you know how to get behind a wheel and start driving? It's shaky in the beginning, right? Which for anything, it's never 100% certain, but in no time at all, you're getting up to speed. Well, how do you know how to drive? It's learned experience. You have seen your parents, your adults in your lives do this mm -hmm. your entire life and you've picked it up. And it's kind of like parenting too for people who are parents. There's, everyone knows there's no handbook given to you about how to be a parent. No, you just, the baby comes out and all of a sudden you're like, I guess this is, we got to figure it out. Yeah. And we've seen other people, we know it's possible. And so we do it. And that's exactly how you should think of experience when it comes to a force multiplier is we have seen the master class happen. We have that experience right along with you. So whatever you've experienced, we've experienced too. And I, I have actually contemplated putting that on my resume because I'm like, I know how the situation developed. I know how it played out. I know what went into the decision making. Like, I feel like that was my experience. Yeah. And I would say the big elephant in the room is just bridging the gap of how could an EA or a chief of staff go from being what they're doing now to an executive? That's mm -hmm. not possible, but it is because I know of at least one incident in throughout business history where that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if about Herb Kelleher. He was the founder of Southwest Airlines. Yes. He took his then admin executive assistant, Colleen Barrett with him everywhere. He eventually promoted her to being president of Southwest Airlines. She was the first female head of an airline. And not only was she was the first female, she was one of the most successful heads of an airline. And the example of that is that she was leading Southwest Airlines when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And we know what happened to the airline industry in and around that time. She was the only airline, she had the only airline that actually was profitable in the quarters beyond 9-11. So not only have I given you an, an example of an EA who stepped up and eventually became an executive, but she was a successful one because I'm telling you, we, we, can, we can walk the walk along with you. We, that's that experience. It's just, we're not given enough opportunity to show you, we mm -hmm. could step in for one of your executives and do that. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that you hit on so many really good pieces and points about what, just what it goes into that EA role and, <laughs> and that it, I mean, quite honestly, you were just, in my opinion, describing an executive with everything that you were mentioning. And, and actually I know the Southwest story, but another one that comes to, comes to mind of somebody I, I met not too long ago, she worked as an EA to an executive who worked at the Young Professionals Organization. Gosh, I'm going to forget the couple of other organizations, but she was an EA for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And they co-founded an organization and now she's the CEO of it. So, and she- Why and not? Was, yeah, well, exactly. Why not? And do you think it's becoming, I don't know necessarily about the executives per as much as 
So I think there's still a lot of area of opportunity there, but I am starting to see more either EAs or chiefs of staff who are going, moving on to start companies of their own. So I believe um, that very similar to the, it's a little bit different than the executive, but it'd be, but founding their own companies. So many of them, they know exactly to your point, they either helped co- executives or founders build companies. So they know exactly how to do it or right. they've seen it be done. So why not go do it on their own? Right. And, and that's um, why they do it because yeah. why would you go to the middle when you could just go straight to running your own? And I, I've had the same considerations myself because yeah. uh, for the same reason, I, I've seen how it's done. I've learned so many lessons. Yeah. Uh, founder's failure is my failure too. And you'd be crazy to not learn from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think um, some of it comes down to like, personal preference to a certain degree, like not every EA or chief of staff does want to be an executive or not every EA exactly. or chief of staff wants to go found a company, but just because there are some who don't doesn't mean that they, those positions can't. In fact, they are exactly. to your point, perfectly positioned to take on executive level roles or, and or founding their own organizations. So sometimes better than almost anyone else in the organization. Absolutely. And, and it's, I, I will say the one thing I'll caution too, is it's hard to I think some founders might be inclined, well, let's start you off somewhere in the middle and then see how you do. The reason that's difficult, because I have been in that position before where I went from being an EA and I I went into being a project manager, people don't understand the level of challenge that you step up to working for a C-level leader. And when you go back somewhere in the middle to being a, a project manager of a $5 million project, the perception of what's challenging, even at that level, is far different than what's challenging in the sea level. And quite honestly, when I had to, when I was just somewhere in the middle, I was, I was a little bored. I'm, mm. That's a lie. I was a lot bored because mm. people thought they knew what was challenging. And I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> no. Well, and I think a, a, a big difference between that too is that your, your focus becomes so narrow when you maybe move into a, a, project management ro- role or program management role, your, your focus really narrows down to that one or two projects versus when we're in this EA or this executive role that, I mean, that's that one project is a blip in your entire week. Right. We have such a larger scope of responsibilities and larger scope of projects, which again, is a personal preference. I would prefer to have a lot of different things. Me I don't too. want a super <laughs> narrow focus. Me. So so there's that to consider as well. What are you most excited about working on in 2023? Right now, my focus is on growing my network personally, professionally, to include more like-minded people. Uh, and I, lo- I love it, but kind of like you were talking about meeting on the Power Hour a few weeks ago, that I just just kind of when you're in a room with other people who think and feel like you do, like it's, there's just this synergy that's created and and You can't duplicate that unless you're around other people who think like you do. And so that that is my big push for this year. Although the other thing I want to put out there, whether it's for me or for founders or other force multipliers, is the founders specifically, create case studies. Give them, if you're afraid to put your force multiplier in an executive, give them a case study. Talk to them about a real problem that you have. Ask them to think through it out loud. If you want, send it to me. I'll help you with it. Just to kind of explain how we what how we step through these things. Because I, I do love to problem solve. I love to troubleshoot. I love to think big, which is kind of part of the force multiplier nature. And so yeah, if somebody wants to, to give me a big challenge and say, hey, we've got this big thing, I, I would love to, I would love to handle that. Cool. I love that. Well, I, I hope people take you up on that because I me too. I, I may have to take you up on that. I'd love to get your eyes and thoughts on a, on a project that we're working on. Where can our listeners connect with you to, to help build your network and to build their network as well? I can find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm pretty active on there. I don't post often enough. I want, I need to change that, but I'm, I read a lot. I absorb a lot. I see who's there. I, I remember names, faces. So I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Perfect. Yeah. We'll put that link in the show notes. And I so appreciate you joining (laughs) us today. I know we're going to hear a lot more from you in in 2023. I know you've got some speaking engagements coming up. uh, And I just think that you are such a force within the community and can't wait to hear more from you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's good. I I just, I just kind of want to make a difference for all the force multipliers out there. And I feel like we're we're really capable and really talented. And yeah, that's what I like speaking about. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you.